give your Bibles open to 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. We'll continue on in our study in 1 John tonight for a few moments. Thanks again for, uh, for all the help for the Mega Trunk or Treat last year. So encouraged about all the, uh, the participation from our church family. It looks like it's the same tonight, and that's exciting. Looking forward to what God's going to do here. And, of course, we're praying to that end. I've been praying for it uh, for a while. I know many other folks have well and planned and spent some money on candy and all that stuff. But for a chance to give the gospel. Listen, of everything else here at First Baptist Church, I want to continue in the gospel at First Baptist Church. Continue. All right, and, and I am thankful that we have a good time as a church family. It's a wonderful place to be, good friends, good fellowship. But if that's all there is, then, then we are missing our, our obligation because we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And we're ambassadors not just to be nice, but to give the gospel and see other lives transformed by the gospel as many of our, all our lives have been transformed as well. So 1 John chapter 2, we talked about this principle, this idea a little bit last week. We want to finish up tonight, if we can, beginning in verse number 24, where John says, Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is a promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to, to preach this afternoon. Lord, I pray again and ask for your help now and then later on, Lord, as I share the gospel and as so many folks are coming here. Lord, we pray you'd hold the weather and make it a, a, an opportune place, Lord, to give candy. But, Lord, we want to have all the barriers removed today so that we can see your hand at work in transforming lives. Lord, a lot of effort, time, and money, and, and other thoughts have gone into this day, Lord, and it would, be, it would be a waste if you're not involved. Lord, please do something here that we give you the honor and glory for. Lord, take this time now. Would you touch our hearts? Help me to say those things that would be helpful and would challenge us. May we respond to your word the way you'd have us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, kind of changed the Sunday night service a little bit, had a couple extra songs. Of course, we made Brother Dalton sing and Pastor Dylan sing. And then, uh, and, uh, and then I, I talked about, are you in or are you out? Talked about jumping in the lake as a, a, one of the young men here at church did. And, and tonight, I'm going to ask you to be like an old lady. I want you to be like an old lady tonight. I mentioned this morning, we had that activity for the senior saints in my house on November 2nd. If you weren't this morning, I was asked, well, what age is that for? And the Lord gave me a thought. The Lord gave me wisdom. It's not mine. The Lord gave me wisdom. If you think you're old, you can come. But I'm not putting a number on that. No, sir. No, ma'am. You split that church wide open. You calling me old? Oh, no. No, you're young. You're young. But tonight, I want to say, I want you to be like an old lady. You say, Pastor Howell, what are you saying? Well, good. I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Because we're going to talk about this concept again to finish up tonight about abiding, specifically in verse 28 and 29, where John says, and now little children. He brings back that term of affection. He, bring back, he brings back that fatherly term where the apostle John now is the, the father of these, many of these Christians in a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, all right, in a church leadership sense. He was the John the Elder. He was an older statesman at this time, and he was looked up to and, and reverenced by these churches. And he says little children as a, as a a notation of affection for them. And then he gives us this, this command, this exhortation, and now little children abide in him. Now I want you to I want to point out that when he says little children at this verse, it applies to all of us. Previously in the chapter, he has split up little children, young men, and fathers with some very specific application inside of those, I believe, those verses. When we come to this, verse 28, and then following in verse 29, he is not just referencing the little children again, like the, the subgroup that he was talking to earlier. He is now encompassing the same group that he would when he begins the chapter in chapter 2, verse number 1, when he says, my little children. So he begins the chapter, chapter 2, with this particular phrase, and I believe concludes this section with this phrase again. Now, 
understand that when he wrote this letter to, to, to the Christians, he did not write in chapters and verses. All right, he did not write chapter 1. All right, he was writing and penning a letter. So we began this section. He began with my little children. And I believe he concludes it in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 2 with the same phrase to bring us back to his idea that, listen, I'm here trying to help you grow. Here, listen, I'm trying to give you some thoughts. I'm trying to be this fatherly, spiritual, fatherly figure in your life. And I want you to pay attention and I want you to heed and I want you to tune in to what I'm telling you. You can almost hear him maybe soften his voice a little bit. Maybe tear up when he says this. So he brings this thought, my little children, and he says these three words, abide in him. He did not say abide in Jesus, but if you miss that part, you've missed the entire point of, of this section of verses so far. We, we cannot get confused and say, well, he meant abide in, in, in uh, my husband. You know, I need to be close to him. No, he's talking about Jesus Christ. He goes, on, he goes on to clarify that when he shall appear. So speaking of Jesus, we may have confidence. And so he, he's talking about us abiding in Jesus Christ. I want us to be like an old lady tonight. I'll tell you why. There is an old lady in my life. It is not my wife. All right, I would not say that, nor that I don't want you to think that. It's my grandmother. She's 95, nine, how old? 95 years old. Some of you have met my grandmother. She's Puerto Rican. About this tall, maybe a little shorter. Eric, remember her from soccer. She is a feisty Puerto Rican. Did you listen to me, young man? That's her shaking a knife. She lives in Puerto Rico, the same house that she's lived in as long as I can remember. A few years back, my parents brought her here to, to Michigan because she was uh, ailing and, and having some failure in health, and so they brought her to, 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 to Michigan. You may not realize this, but the weather patterns in Michigan and Puerto Rico are not the same. <laughs> Apparently, they have terrible weather in Puerto Rico. Unlike Michigan, they don't have seasons in Puerto Rico. They do have seasons, hurricane and non-hurricane. Hot and much hotter. They have beaches, but we have beaches in Michigan. Have you been to Lake Superior? All right, it's always frozen. It's okay. It's the same as the Caribbean beach. They have water. It's like our water. They just have a little more salt in it than we do. And you can take a salt shaker with you. She absolutely did not enjoy being in Michigan. And when I say that, my mother and my family who, who were around when she was here will know that that is the understatement of the century. Because she's been in Puerto Rico for a whole long time. A few weeks back when I went back from my grandfather's funeral service, I got the chance to go visit my grandmother in Vega Baja. At the little house that I think every time I've gone to Puerto Rico, I've never been to a different house that she's been in. The same little house. It's changed a little bit. It's a different color now than it was, but it's the same setup. Uh, probably it appears to be the same couch as far back as, as I can remember. And I believe I went there when I was five, and I have memories of being that young. I might have been six, but I think I was five when I first went there. Remember those things. My grandmother does not want to leave her house. She is, if we can say this, abiding in her house. I'm going to challenge us tonight to be like an old lady. You say, how are you calling your grandma old? Because she's 95. <laughs> That's old. We'll look at this passage as we break it apart and then conclude with that challenge. When we purpose to remain in Jesus Christ, I want to purpose to, to do a few things. To remain is to, is to understand that we've relocated. You see, we were unsaved, now we're saved. Our destination was hell, now it's heaven. We relocated from ourself and we abide, we want to be in the Savior. You see, before we're saved, it's what we think, what we do. We're dead to sin and we're dead in our trespasses. Uh, Paul in Romans says it like this, that we are servants to those members that we obey. Before we're saved, we're servants to sin and to our own members. But when Jesus Christ shows up and we're saved, now we can serve our Savior. We're relocated from ourselves to the Savior. 
were relocated from sight to faith. You see, when we purpose to remain in Jesus Christ, we're purposing to know that we've been relocated. We're purposing to recognize, to remain is to recognize, where am I? I've had the unique opportunity of, being, uh, of passing out a couple of times in my life. If you ever passed out, it's not so much the passing out that hurts, it's waking back up. When you wake back up and the blood is rushing back in your, in your head, it, there's, there's, for me at least, there's for me those, those few moments of, where am I? What am I doing here? Why am I on the ground? Why is this strange person's face this far from my face? And then a few moments later, all the thoughts come rushing back in. Oh, this is why in the headache companies like that. And, and then the jokes begin. That's fine. It is what it is. But I need to recognize as a Christian where I am. Because I'm afraid that sometimes we have some Christians who are in a brand new location abiding in Jesus Christ, but they don't have a clue where they're at. They don't have a clue that, that now that they're abiding in Jesus Christ and, and He is the vine, we are the branches, they don't understand what that position means. Uh, John says here, now little children, abide in Him, remain in Him, be, be connected to Him. Don't forget where you're at, where you're supposed to be at. All right, you're now inseparably connected to Jesus Christ. So live in that, enjoy that, love that, be in that place. Not only is it to recognize, you have to resist. There are different things that pull us away from abiding with Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's technology. Read that book about the distracted mind. It talks about how all day long we're under a constant barrage of information. Because of that information, it takes our minds. Our minds cannot focus on really any one thing, this book says. And it is changing our minds and how we focus or how we don't focus on things. I think it is true that as we, as we go through the mall or drive down the road, there's this sign and this sign and this interaction with our phones there excuse me, constantly buzzing. And it's hard to have your phone buzz in your pocket and not look at it, is it not? How about you're sitting in church and that little virus, bzz, bzz. what does your mind do? I wonder who it is. I bet it's an emergency because they know I'm in church. Pastor Lett told me the other night, I think it was Monday, maybe Monday night, he was sitting there and all of a sudden, uh, uh, Chrissy calls him. She was down visiting the kids and she, she calls him. He looks at it and he goes, oh no, it's during the service, I think Pastor Chapel was preaching at that moment, he tells me. It's somewhere in that, in that service and he texts her, I'm, at, I, I, I'm in the service. A few moments later he said, she calls back again. So now he's about to get up like, like most of us would if we're in church like that and my wife calls me. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, something horrible has happened. You know, and, and the only way I'm going to be interrupted is something terrible is going on. And I guess he actually doesn't answer, but then, then a text comes through from his wife that says, Sorry, Sawyer, the, grand, the grandson or the granddaughter, the grandchild, got a hold of the phone. One of the grandchildren got a hold of the phone. <laughs> that happens, right? But your phone buzzes in your pocket, right? And you're like, Oh my goodness, the distractions. The distractions cause us not to remain. We have to resist the distractions to make sure that we spend, first of all, the time to abide with Jesus Christ. The time to abide with Jesus Christ. You see, abiding is much more than me just saying, I'm abiding. Here I am. It's spending time with my Savior. In communication, Him talking to me, me talking to Him. What pulls you away from abiding with Jesus Christ? Football game? Sometimes. A great talk radio host? A text, social media, family. All these things pull at us and want our attention and our time. And yet John says, now little children, abide. It's going to take some focus to abide with Jesus Christ. You see, when my grandmother came here to Michigan, it was us that pulled her away. We said, you're coming to Michigan. We pulled her away. She didn't like that very much. You say, what if she hears you on live stream? I'm not too worried. Sometimes she logs in. She does not always remember who I am. 
right? And I love her to death, and sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. So if she hears me, she'll, a few minutes, probably forget what I said. Okay. She wasn't too happy. She said some things that, that uh, I remember, <laughs> I probably shouldn't even tell this story. I, I, even, I shouldn't, but like Pastor says, you listen so much better. We're at lunch one Sunday afternoon. Mom, you remember this story. My mom comes in, for picture, you know, particularly a little sad in that day. My grandmother had, had uncharacteristically said some things that were unkind. And, and my mom was feeling some of the brunt of that, as you ladies do, right? For your parents, it's tough. You know, it's, a t- it's a tough thing. But my around my mom was at the lunch table. I said, Mom, it's okay. I said, I get it. She looks at me a little strange. I said, Mom, it's okay. I get it. I said, um, you're not the favorite. I'm not the favorite. I said, Mom, it's okay. Your mom's crazy and... And my mom's crazy. <laughs> she hit me, Brother Bador. My mom hit me. It's not right. <laughs> but I wish we would fight the distractions with the same tenacity that I saw my grandmother fight being in Michigan. Say, you know what? No, this will not pull me away from abiding with Jesus Christ. I choose to spend time with my Savior. I choose to spend time in His Word. And nothing, nothing will stand in my way. Take some time. Take some temperance, moderation, or restraint. I found this, I, this statistic. And statistics can often be misconstrued. It's an interesting thing I read. It says nearly all parents of children under the age of 13, 96% contend that they have the primary responsibility for teaching their children values. So of all these parents that were polled, 96 said that it is their responsibility to teach their children values. Just 1% said the church has that task, and another 1% said it was the role of the child's school. So of, of, of all these parents that were pulled, they said 96%, they said that it is my responsibility as a parent to teach my child values. But then the research went on to ask this question. It revealed that a majority of parents, over 50%, do not spend any time during a week discussing religious matters or studying religious materials with their children. would say, that's my job, to teach my child values. But over half would say that not even once during the week do I discuss religious things. You see, what you abide in, what's inside, will always come out. If you're spending time with the Lord, godliness will come out. If you're spending time with the Savior, His words will come out. It doesn't mean that everything that you possibly say will be a Bible verse, but you cannot help, if you're abiding with Jesus Christ, cannot have his effect and his influence come out of your speech. You can't tell me that that not once during the week some religious idea, thought, or scripture will come out. Can we as Christians say this? We have so much of the Bible. Would Would it be too much to say that at least once a day we ought to talk about Jesus Christ? If we're abiding with him, not if we're claiming to abide, but if we're truly abiding with him, will he not come out at least once a day? Not just when we're at church on Sundays, but you're at home, you're driving down the road, you're you're sitting in a car, you're you're working with the same guy on the same line for 25 years, and how often does he come out? If you abide with him, then he'll come out. But to remain is to resist, to recognize, and lastly, To respond. To respond. You see, responding brings a closeness and responding brings a confidence. That's what John says. He says that when he, that's Jesus, shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Sometimes uh, the patience and confidence and the hope mean the same thing. This one John clarifies and says, listen, there's going to be some people that may be ashamed at the coming of Jesus Christ. But he says, I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to be embarrassed when Christ shows up. And so the way you're not embarrassed is to abide. It's interesting that he does not say, in order to not be ashamed, make sure you pass out some tracts. He could have, right? Right? Make sure you're always witnessing. He could have said that, but he said, to not be ashamed at his coming, make sure you abide. You know why? Because if you abide, you're going to want to give the gospel out. If you're abiding, you're going to want to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. But he says, listen, I want you to abide so you're not ashamed 
Responding brings confidence. When you, when you abide, you respond. When you abide, you feel close. When you abide, you know what Jesus desires. I'm so glad to have a wonderful wife like my wife, Doreen. I want to be close to her. Over the years, I've learned what she likes and what she doesn't like, and vice versa. It was early on in our marriage that um, I realized we were going to have a potential communication problem. Any marriage can have that, correct? Can I get an amen? amen. I realized one day when we were talking that as she was explaining this, that uh, she explained it once and then twice and then three times. I feel that I'm a fairly competent individual. I understood the first time. And, and so I responded as a young married man, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, dear, yes, dear, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, that prompted another conversation of communication. She says, she says, honey, when you say that, I feel like you're like d demeaning me, you know, and you're not listening to me. And I said, well, honey, you have to help me here because when you explain this, I feel like you're treating me like the second graders you teach at that time. And, and so I feel like I understand a little quicker than a second grader. All right, so, so how do we get from here to here? You want to explain it. Apparently, I'm not giving you the visual cues, all right, that you need in a classroom. And uh, I don't need the three explanations, three different ways. I got it the first time. I'm processing. Right? Well, process different speeds. She goes, okay. I said, well, honey, I won't say, uh, um, I won't say yes to her. I think it was for her. I won't say yes to her. So it was like the next day, okay, and, and, and she came home, and, and uh, something was happening, and she was explaining this, and she explained it again, and explained it again. So I say, okay, dear, okay, okay. She said, that's not any better. I said, all right, honey, I need, I need a word I can say, all right? And the word means stop talking. I'm thinking. I'm not trying to be mean, but we got to figure this thing out. And we got a good word, all right? Uh, now I run, and, you know, and she yells after me, and it works out. No, 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 no. But it, but it brings a confidence and a closeness because I begin to learn from then how she thinks. She began to learn how I think. That's what I want to do with Jesus Christ. I want to respond so I can bring a closeness and a confidence with Jesus Christ. I want to be close to him. I want to know what he thinks about other people because he talks about that in his word. I want to know what he thinks about my life. He talks about that in his word. To remain, to abide, is to respond. was a pastor. Pastor Olford was a pastor of a Baptist church in New York. He had the opportunity to lead his brother, who had been an agnostic most of his life, to the Lord as he lay on his deathbed, desperately ill. One day, Pastor Olford was called to the hospital room to visit his brother, who was quite disturbed. So he went to the room and he said, he said to his brother, Richard, I want you to know you're saved. And even though you have a terminal illness and even though you're going to die, you're saved and you're going to heaven when you die. You don't have to be afraid to die. His brother said, oh, you don't understand. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. It's not that I'm afraid to die. I'm ashamed to die. We have to abide so much in Jesus Christ. To be living so close to Jesus that when he appears, we can have confidence and not be ashamed of his coming. Amen. I'm asking us if we're like an old lady tonight. If we're running back to that house that we know, a place of comfort, in Vega Baja, where the weather is beautiful. The sea is bright, wet, sunny, and salty. Beaches are warm. Comfort place. Are we like that with our Savior? Are we so pulled off at a location, so distracted, that we wouldn't know home if it hit us in the face? Let's be like an old lady tonight. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for saving us. Lord, may we abide with you and allow nothing to distract us or pull us off from that, Lord. May we be so close to you that when you appear, we'll, be, we'll have confidence that you're coming. One would say, Pastor Howell, as you were speaking, God spoke to me, and there are some things that have been distracting me from abiding with Jesus Christ. Would you pray for me that I would be like that old lady? I want to, I want to abide with Jesus Christ, just like John challenges us.
to be. Would you pray for me tonight? When you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me tonight? Lift that hand up, sit back down. Amen. Amen. Else, would you pray for me? I don't want to be distracted or, or taken off that path from abiding with Jesus Christ. Who else? And raise my hand before I raise it now. Would you pray for me? I abide with Jesus Christ. I have confidence that his coming. Lord, I, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know the hearts. I pray you'd give us the wisdom and strength to abide with you. Lord, guide this time in Jesus' name. Amen. As the piano plays, uh, stand to our feet. The altar is open. You need to come do business with God. You come. If, if someone to pray with you, we have folks in front. Open a Bible and talk to you.